now try to yes now i'm recording thank you so much good uh, may i start uh, now yes please welcome yeah. uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen uh, first of all i would like to thank sezin uh, for uh, this very kind introduction and uh, also I would like to thank uh, Serim uh, for uh, this invitation. And I wish I could be with you in Turkey. I uh, never visited Turkey, although we are neighbors. So uh, I hope that uh, next time I would have a chance uh, to uh, be in person with you. Today, I will be talking about the advancements made uh, in nanosize zeolites and probably you know very well what is a zeolite, uh, but I would like to start uh, with a short definition for the young fellow in the group. Zeolites are crystalline aluminosilicates with well-defined pores in the range of 0.4 to 2 nanometers. Zeolites have very high specific surface area, but not as high as the metal organic framework type materials that you probably know very well. And due to the fact that zeolites have very tunable chemical composition, high thermal and mechanical stability, they are widely used in classical applications such as catalysis, gas separation, ion exchange processes. Also zeolites we considered as environmentally friendly materials because they consist of silicon and aluminum only. Just for your curiosity, one gram of zeolite has a pore length of 600 million kilometers, while the distance between the sun and the earth is 150 billion kilometers, which means that the total length of the channel of one gram zeolite, in this case is ZSM5 with MFI type structure, is about four times bigger than the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Currently, there are 253 different zeolite types registered at the International Zeolite Association database. But from these 253 different types of zeolites, we could synthesize only 25 with nano-size dimensions. And today I will be talking explicitly for nano-size zeolites. Why we are interested in nanosized zeolites? Because via decreasing the crystal dimension, we could substantially reduce the diffusion length of the crystals, and thus we could reduce the mass transport limitations. Also, via decreasing the size of the crystals, we could imagine processing of molecules which are much bigger than the pore opening of the zeolites, and thus we could carry out, for example, catalysis of bulky molecule at the external surface of zeolite nanocrystals. Via decreasing the size of the zeolite, also we could avoid unwanted secondary reaction and co-formation due to the fast diffusion. The objective of my uh, talk today will be, first, I will be talking for the synthesis of nano-size zeolites. I will be revealing the possibility to synthesize nanocrystals free of organic structural directing agents using colloidal precursor suspension, where entirely we replace the organic template with alkali metal cations. I will give you several examples how we could synthesize these very small nanoparticles with large to small pores. Then I will be talking about the possibility to synthesize nanocrystals with control silanol defect sites. And why we would like to control the silanols? 
because we know that the silanose brings hydrophilicity to the materials and the silanose are the centers for coking in catalysis. Along my presentation, also I will be given examples for the use of these nanoparticles for selective absorption of carbon dioxide in the presence of methane for preparation of selective chemical sensors using different zeolite nanocrystals and different strategies. And I will end up with several examples how we could use these nanoparticles for biomedical purposes. As you may know, the classical uh, concept for preparation of nanozeolites relies on the use of organic structural directing agent. Via using organic structural directing agents, such as tetraalkyl ammonium cations, we are able to stabilize water clear precursor suspension and under subsequent hydrothermal treatment, we could transfer this clear precursor suspension into colloidal zeolite suspension. The great advantage of using organic structural directing agents is the possibility to synthesize high silica zeolite and even pure silica zeolites could be synthesized via organic templates. But a big disadvantage is the very low crystalline yield here are given examples for phosgazite and LTA zeolites, which are high alumina containing zeolites. The crystalline yield is between 2 and 10 percent, while for high silica zeolite, the crystalline yield is between 25 and 35 percent. Therefore, Currently, we focus our attention on the development of a new synthesis concept where partially or completely we replace the organic structural directing agents with inorganic cation. And currently, we could synthesize nine nano zeolites where only alkali metal cations are applied as structural directing agents. And from the list of these materials, you could see that the most important zeolites for industrial processing, such as phosgazite, shabazite, mordenite, LTL, are synthesized with crystalline yield above 70%, which is similar to the industrial processes. The key point here is to stabilize clear precursor slurry under specific condition, this very viscous slurry is transformed into zeolite suspension. The first example I would like to show you concerns the preparation of phosgazite zeolite nanocrystals synthesized from very dense precursor suspension containing only sodium hydroxide. Via varying the synthesis conditions, we've been able to synthesize nanoparticles with extremely small particle diameter of about 10 nanometers, or via increasing the temperature or time, we've been able to increase the size to 70 or 400 nanometers. What is interesting here is that by decreasing the size of the crystals from 400 to 10 nanometers, we did not decrease the micropore volume of these materials. And this is the first example demonstrating that by decreasing the size of the crystals, we do not suffer from decreasing the micropore volume. And the micropore volume of these ultra small nanoparticles is comparable to the micropore volume of the micron size phosgazite zeolite. And this is actually the micropore volume predicted for phosgazite type uh, zeolite theoretically predicted. 
This ultra stable nano size phosphorescent crystals were stabilized in colloidal suspensions with different concentration, vary from two weight percent up to 25 weight percent, and they were stored at ambient conditions for several years. And the interesting observation is that these nanoparticles, they do not sedimentate, they do not change with time, and they appear as very stable colloidal suspension. Why we are interested in these stable colloidal suspensions? Because further, we would like to use this suspension as coating material, or we would like to have injectable nanoparticles for biomedical purposes. With decreasing the size of the crystals, also we realize that we open a new property for the material. Here is given the xenon NMR spectra collected from these ultra small nano size phosphorescite nanoparticles with diameter of 10 nanometers in comparison to the xenon NMR spectra collected from micron size phosphorescite where uh, xenon was delivered at the same temperature and same conditions. As you could see here in the spectrum of the nano size phosphorescite, we have two peaks, and these two peaks correspond to xenon penetrating in the super cage, but also in the sodalite cage. And this was very interesting for us because we did not expect that the xenon, which is much bigger than the opening of the sodalite, would be possible to enter. But this was possible due to the fact that the sodalite cages, which are located at the external surface of the crystals, were open. And then the xenon could penetrate from the sodalite, not close uh, uh, cages located at the external surface. While in the micron size phosphorescite, well, the, where the crystals are fully accomplished, we have soda light covered with lids or completely soda light. And therefore, we observe only one xenon peak that corresponds to xenon penetrated in the super cage only. Another example I would like to show you is on the synthesis of EMT type zeolite. EMT type zeolite is a material synthesized almost 30 years ago with a very expensive organic template. This template was 18 krone 6 eater. And then here our task was partially to replace the 18 krone eater with sodium hydroxide and to probe whether we would be able to synthesize EMT type zeolite. And ENCPO su uh, succeeded in the complete replacement of this template with sodium hydroxide and then synthesizing ultra small EMT nanocrystals with plate like morphology, size of 10 to 15 nanometers, and thickness of about 2 to 3 nanometers. So this is example how via following very carefully the crystallization kinetic of zeolite synthesized in the presence of the classical sodium rich precursor suspension, we could capture one phase which is not stable. And EMT, if we continue with the hydrothermal treatment will transform into phosphorescent. If we extend the crystallization time, we'll end up with sodalite nanocrystals. So this is one example how we could capture not thermally stable phases via studying the crystal growth kinetics. These nanoparticles also were synthesized with bigger diameters of about 70 nanometers 
via exchanging the microwave uh, hydrothermal treatment with classical uh, heating. And also, uh, very important, the crystalline yield of these ultra small nanoparticles was always above 65%. Up to now, I show you examples how we could synthesize zeolite with large pores. But currently, we are very much interested in the preparation of nano zeolites with small pores. And one of the material we selected was a zeolite with RHO structure, which we call rho zeolite. Rho zeolite is very interesting for gas separation because it has very large cavities. The size is about 11 angstrom, but also it has pore limiting diameter, which is about 4.7 angstrom. And therefore, here we wanted to create materials that it's able to selectively absorb CO2 in the presence of methane, for example. This raw zeolite was synthesized recently via using a mix in organic cations and stabilizing clear precursor suspension where as cations, we use sodium and cesium. These two cations were used not only to prepare the clear precursor suspension, but also to stabilize the structure. Via using this synthesis approach, we synthesize rho zeolite with different silicon to aluminum ratio from 1.4 to 2.1, and the particle size was very between 50 and 100 nanometers. Another interesting observation is that the presence of cesium stabilized the raw structure and these raw nanocrystals became very stable up to 550 degree. And the stability of the crystal was followed via in situ X-ray diffraction. Here you could see under dehydration of the rose zeolite, instead of one break peak, we observe two peaks, and then under rehydration, going from 300 to room temperature, we have seen the disappearance of one of the peak, and again only one break peak was observed. This reversibility was confirmed in several cycles. And then our conclusion was that this rho zeolite actually is flexible. And the flexibility of the rho zeolite is due to the ability of the cesium cation to displace out from and into the double eight member ring window site. And as you could see here, undergoing from hydrated to dehydrated phase, we've been able to determine the size of these eight member rings and it changed from 1.87 to 0 0.9 and 2.16. And then under rehydration, it goes back to the initial stage. Similar study was carried out with carbon dioxide and we observe the same flexibility. And this flexibility, as I mentioned, is due to the ability of the cesium to be displaced in and out from the eight, double eight member rings, which are a part of the row structure. And as I mentioned, the interest in this material is coming from the fact that we would like to have a material that is selective for carbon dioxide, but at the same time to be able to reject methane. Here are given the TG data uh, for this rose light subjected to 10 subsequent cycles of absorption and desorption of CO2. And you could see that the capacity of the rose zeolite is 
almost intact, fully preserved. And at the same time, we did not see any methane absorbed in the raw nanoparticles. Another interesting observation is that after 10 cycles, the crystalline structure of the material is fully preserved. I show you example how we could synthesize small pore zeolite, such as raw zeolite, but also we were wondering whether we could uh, synthesize shabazite. As you may know, shabazite is extremely interesting zeolite because it's the main catalyst in MTO reaction. Also, it's the main material for denox. And shell zeolite is so attractive because it has small pores, three-dimensional framework structure, and the size of the pores is in the range of 3.8 to 3.9 angstrom. In this case, Again, we stabilize clear precursor suspension, but in this case, we use three inorganic cations. In addition to sodium and cesium, we added potassium. And why we added potassium? Because from the previous synthesis of micron-sized shabazite, we learned that potassium is the classical inorganic cation that stabilize the Shabazite cage. And therefore, we decided to mix these three cations, first sodium to be used to have a clear precursor suspension, second potassium to stabilize the Shabazite cage, and then cesium to bring the selectivity which we would like to have for CO2 in the presence of other analytes. From the precision electron diffraction tomography, also we've been able to localize exactly where is placed the cesium, but also these results were confirmed by Riffel refinement. Using this material, also uh, we wanted to probe whether is selective for CO2 and whether we could uh, observe some uh, flexibility in the structure. And therefore, we carry out the absorption of CO2 via in situ X-ray diffraction. The interesting observation here is that under desorbing the water and then delivering the CO2 at high temperature, we have seen a change in the intensity of the break peak, and this is the most intense break peak at two minus one zero. And then going from 350 to room temperature, we decrease the intensity, which is expected. And then under activation, we go to the point two prime, which is exactly at the same uh, value as the initial point two, which shows that the absorption uh, and desorption are fully reversible. And also we follow the change of the evolution of the unit cell parameters A and C, and we have seen that our structure is very stable. And again, I have to mention that the stability is coming from the presence of cesium. These Shabazite nanocrystals also were subjected uh, to absorption of CO2 in the presence of methane. And this absorption was followed by a thermogravimetry via CO2 absorption isotherm. And we could see that under delivering CO2 here represented with the blue line, the weight of our sample increase due to the absorption of CO2. However, under delivering methane, the weight of the sample is almost constant. So this shows that Shabazite selectively absorbs CO2 in the presence of methane. 
Also, uh, we study the effect of the silica to alumino ratio on uh, the CO2 adsorption, and we found out that material with silicon to aluminum ratio of about two is the best for this application. And we adsorb eight CO2 molecule per unit cell, which brings the highest selectivity of the material. We also perform the multi-cycle adsorption measurements on these materials. And as you could see here, the capacity of the shavazite towards CO2 is preserved and also the crystalline structure was intact and did not deteriorate along the experiments. Up to now, I show you how we could modify the framework structure, how we could modify the pore opening of nano zeolites but also we were wondering whether we could modify the morphology of the crystals. And recently, we've been able to synthesize BPH nanosheets from organic free precursor suspension at ambient conditions. In this case, we stabilize water clear precursor suspension in the presence of trication but with different silica to alumino ratio in comparison with the shabazite I showed you before. And then we expose this clear precursor suspension to aging for 21 days, and we follow the change in the appearance of the colloidal suspension. As you could see with time, this suspension became more milky but we did not observe any sedimentation. And no matter whether we extend the time of the aging to 21 days, we found out that the crystals became fully crystalline at 14 days aging. And after 21 days aging, the exerday pattern is identical to the previous sample. So this is one example how we could synthesize nano zeolites with uh, unexpected morphology. From the high resolution transmission electron microscopy, we learn that these crystals are nano sheets with diameter of about five to 10 uh, nanometers and the length of the nanosheets is between 50 to 100 nanometers. One other interesting observation is that these nanosheets synthesize in the presence of cesium are extremely stable, in contrast to the micron size BPH. Micron size BPH was synthesized several years ago by BP, uh, it's a British petroleum company, and in this case, they use potassium. If we try to record the nitrogen adsorption isotherm from this micron size BPH crystals, we have seen that we do not have any porosity, and this is due to the fact that the BPH micron size does not survive after heating at 350 degrees under vacuum, the structure is collapsed, while these nanosheets synthesize at room temperature, survive the calcination, they show high micropore volume, and at the same time, they show very high textural mesoporosity, which is coming from the packing of the nanosheets during the drying. These BPH zeolite nanosheets also were used for CO2 adsorption. And I have to say that the capacity of this nanosheet is similar to shabazite. However, they have one advantage. And the advantage is the morphology. This morphology is extremely interesting for further immobilization in membranes where preferred orientation 
of the nanosheets could be achieved due to their morphology and due to their very small nano sizes. Up to now, I show you how we could synthesize nanocrystals using inorganic structural directing agents only. But as you know, for catalysis, also we have to synthesize high silica zeolite, and also we have to prepare materials that are very stable and resistant to coking. So here, our task was to synthesize high silica MFI zeolite with very little or without defects sites. In order to achieve this, we synthesize first hydrophobic pure siliceous MFI zeolite, where as a defect healing element, tungsten was edited. The tungsten was edited together with sodium. So the initial precursor used to prepare this colloidal suspension was sodium tungstenate. And then we have seen that the samples containing tungsten have very ideal surfaces, very clean surfaces, in contrast to the pure silica MFI zeolite. And the first evidence that tungsten was introduced into the defect site is provided by X-ray diffraction. As you could see here, in the pure siliceous XRD pattern, we have single peaks, while in the tungsten containing zeolite, these single break peaks are splitted. This splitting indicates the change from orthorhombic to a monoclinic cell. And also we have seen that the unit cell volume increase via adding tungsten to the framework structure. And this is expected because tungsten is bigger than silicon. Further, this point defects in the MFI zeolite was studied by silicon NMR spectroscopy. And as expected, the pure siliceous zeolite has a lot of Q3 species and the Q4 species are very broad, <clears throat> while the tungsten containing MFI zeolite does not contain any Q3 and the Q4 species are very well resolved. And these Q4 species are so well resolved as in a crystal synthesized in the presence of fluorine with particle dimension of about 60 microns. From the CP mass measurements, also we could see that the tungsten containing MFI zeolite does not contain any bands uh, corresponding to Q2 and Q3, which is exactly the same as for zeolite synthesized in fluoride media. Further, we confirm that these MFI nanocrystals synthesized in the presence of tungsten do not have any silanols via IR spectroscopy. Here in blue are presented the IR spectra from the tungsten containing zeolites. And as you could see here, we do not have any bands above 3,500 reverse centimeters, while in the pure siliceous zeolite prior activation, we have two bands that corresponds to isolated external and internal silanol as well as a band corresponding to the silanol nest. So combining the silicon NMR with IR, as well as with theoretical calculation, we confirm that the tungsten goes in the defect site, goes in the nest defects, and thus heal the defect site in the MFI zeolite. Why we would like to put 
tungsten in the defect side because via preparing material free of defects, we could increase substantially the stability of this material when we perform catalysis, but also we could decrease the coking. And here is shown that the tungsten containing zeolite is extremely stable up to 900 degree also after steaming and after steaming in different, uh, in the presence of different gases. Very recently, a modified procedure for preparation of molybdenum MFI defect-free nanocrystals was developed. And here, the molybdenum was introduced via post-synthesis hydrothermal treatment which means that first we synthesize pure siliceous MFI, and then we purify the material, we calcine the material, and then we subjected this calcine template-free MFI nanocrystals to a treatment of water containing sodium molybdate at 90 degree for several days. And as a result, Again, we observe this splitting, which is the first indication that we put molybdenum in the desired defect site of MFI zeolite. Using EDS and TEM, we confirm that these nanoparticles have homogeneous molybdenum distribution, and from the high resolution TEM, we have seen that this white spot here correspond to molybdenum atomically distributed within the MFI zeolite in contrast to a sample prepared with impregnation. On the top panel, you could see the same nanoparticles, but molybdenum with the same concentration was uh, added also uh, to the material, but via impregnation. And under heating, treatment, and calcination, we were able to introduce the molybdenum, but this molybdenum is not with atomistic uh, distribution. And this molybdenum also is agglomerated during the catalytic reaction. Then again, we ask ourselves, do we really heal the defects in the MFI? And the answer is provided here. Sample prepared via impregnation contains two bands, one that corresponds to the defect site and one band in the IR spectrum corresponding to the isolated external and internal silanols, while in the case of molybdenum MFI synthesized via direct approach, we fully eliminate the nest defects while still we have some external defects. And this is due to the fact that nanoparticles have very high external surface and we added too little molybdenum and molybdenum in this case was around 0.5 to 1%, and therefore we could not eliminate all the external defect sites. Further, we study also these materials with the phosphorus NMR, and here as a probe molecule, we use trimethyl phosphine oxide. Trimethyl um, TMPO uh, is used for abbreviation, was impregnated in both sample, sample obtained via direct synthesis approach and via impregnation. And here you could see completely different spectra. The sample uh, which we call defect-free sample contains only one band at 45, which is associated with a TMPO adsorbed on molybdenum acidic site and also a band at 29 that corresponds to the physisorb TMPO since we put in excess TMPO. While in the case of the impregnated sample, we have a peak at 35, 
which is associated with molybdenum oxide. So adding molybdenum uh, via impregnation, we form not only molybdenum zero, but also molybdenum oxides. And also we have a lot of silanos, which is expressed with the presence of a band at 50 ppm. As I mentioned, here our task was to demonstrate that via modifying the silanos, we could increase substantially the stability of the material. And why we would like to have very stable material? Because we would like to perform a reaction outside of the comfort zone of the zeolite, a reaction such as methane dehydroaromatization that takes place above 700 Celsius. And here are show two samples, the molybdenum MFI zeolite synthesized by a direct synthesis approach in comparison to the reference sample obtained via impregnation. These two samples were subjected to MDA reaction at 850 degree in three cycles, then regenerated, regenerated uh, under steaming at uh, 550 degree. And here you could see that the defect free zeolite is extremely stable. And even this Q4 species became more resolved after three cycles of MDA reaction and steaming, while in the case of the reference sample, we could see that the structure did not survive. Here are shown the results from the catalysis. And a very interesting result here is that the molybdenum silano-free ZSM5 is extremely stable in one and three cycles of catalytic reaction, does not change, while the reference sample, after five hours on stream, the conversion deteriorated. Also, we found as a main product hydrogen, and this is of extreme interest for us to be able to go directly from methane to hydrogen production. Up to now, I show you how we could synthesize nanoparticles without organic template or how we could uh, anneal the defects in these nanoparticles via using inorganic theatum such as molybdenum, tungsten, but also we've been working with zirconium, tin, vanadium, and these methods are applied to other T atoms as well. But when we talk about nanomaterials, we have also to consider non-classical applications. And here very shortly, I would like to mention some of the work uh, we've been doing uh, also during the last 20 years. And we've been trying to use these nanoparticles for preparation of selective chemical sensors, and not only zeolites, but as you know, MOF materials are considered for this application, where zeolite and MOFs are used either as active compounds, functional elements, or as secondary elements playing the supporting role. The first concept we've been applying for preparation of these chemical sensors is rely on the preparation of tin films on quartz crystal microbalances. And as you know, under absorption and desorption of analyte, we could see a change in the frequency of the QCM. And here we demonstrated that we could prepare sensors very selective for NO2 and CO2 in the range of 1 to 100 ppm and the saturation of these gases in the tin to thick films was achieved in less than one minute. Also we've been using these zeolite nanoparticles uh, in combination in photopolymers 
And then these U-light nanoparticles were deposited in different shapes, in uh, different surfaces, plastic, silicon wafers, uh, etc. And here the task was to demonstrate that we could prepare irreversible, high visible humidity sensors. And why we would like to have irreversible humidity sensors? This is mostly for packaging materials where, for example, compounds uh, important for semiconducting industry should be shipped at certain humidity. And here you could see that the S prepared pattern, which contains hydrated phosphorite, has a band at about 650 nanometers. Under heating and removal of water, then we change the band below 400 nanometers. And then if we expose this sensor to 80% of relative humidity, we change the color. And this is a proof that uh, the shipment was not carried out at appropriate humidity. Another possibility is to use a cantilever sensor array. And this is also a classical approach for developing chemical sensors. But here, what we edited, we edited trenches. Within the sensor device, we made mechanical trenches, and then these trenches were filled with zeolite nanoparticles. And as you know, via controlling the volume of the zeolite and controlling the gas absorbed in the zeolite, we could change the frequency of the device. The last application I would like to mention is related with the use of zeolite for biomedical purposes. And as I mentioned, always we've been trying to synthesize nanoparticles very stable in colloidal suspension, which we consider as injectable nanozeolites. Currently, we are carrying three projects. The first one is to use zeolite as active components, again, escape microorganism. And those are the species of particular concern because they cause many serious hospital infections and they are very resistant toward available commercial antibiotics. And for this study, we've been using metal containing nanozeolites. The second project is related with the use of zeolite nanoparticles for selective capturing of fibrinogen and fibrinogen is the compound that cause cardiovascular diseases. But today, very shortly, I will show you our very recent results on the use of these nanoparticles as hyperoxic gas carrier. And as gas carrier, we consider phosphorite nanocrystal doped with oxygen and CO2 for control delivery in glioblastoma. And of course, prior using nanoparticles for biomedical application, we've been carry out all the toxicity measurements and we concluded that the zeolites are non-toxic if they do not contain organic structural directing agents. So here we wanted to use the nanoparticles as terranostic tool on one side to use nanoparticles in colloidal suspension doped with gadolinium, copper and iron to be used as a contrast agent for diagnosis. But also we wanted to use the empty space in these nanoparticles to encapsulate molecules appropriate for chemotherapy or for fluorescent imaging, and thus to be used for vectorization therapy. So this combination is called from our colleagues from the Department of Biochemistry, Terranostic II. 
The idea here was to be able to deliver zeolite nanoparticles doped with oxygen and CO2 in glioblastoma. Glioblastoma is the most common and aggressive primary brain tumor in adults. And here we wanted to use the zeolite to bring the oxygen in glioblastoma to increase the tissue oxygen tension and also to bring CO2 to be able to increase the blood flow locally in the tumor part or in the glioblastoma part. And how we imagine this? We imagine that these nanoparticles would not penetrate in the healthy brain because we have a blood-brain barrier, but they will go in the glioblastoma place because we have the uh, leaky vessels. Now we are uh, at the stage of in vivo uh, measurements. And actually this is a project going already for more than five years. And now the in vivo measurements are carried out on rodent and also on non-human primate. Uh, those are the uh, very uh, small uh, monkeys, the marmoset. And the first thing people follow after injection of zeolites, they injected the zeolite from one to 26 consequent days, is how the weight of the animal is changing. And if the weight is progressively increasing, it is a very good news. So our particles are not toxic. And the second parameter follow was the RTR pressure. They found out that during the injection of the zeolite, which is 1.5%, 300 milliliters, the arterial pressure decreased, but then uh, very slowly after one minute goes back to the normal. This was exactly the same for the marmoset. The arterial pressure decreased, but then in about a minute goes back to the initial stage. And then the question we had was, yes, we could deliver the nanoparticles. These nanoparticles, they reach the glioblastoma. And here you could see a brain taken from a mouse. And this white spot corresponds to the glioblastoma before injecting the zeolite. Uh, and this zeolite was doped with gadolinium. Then five minutes after injecting the gadolinium containing zeolite. And here you could see the two pictures subtracted. And this colored circle corresponds to the place where the zeolite was accumulated. So here we observe the uh, location of the zeolite in the healthy tissue. As you could see, we do not have any nanoparticles in the healthy tissue, while the zeolite nanoparticles doped with gadolinium were all accumulated in the tumor. And we have seen that the zeolite reached the tumor within two minutes. Also, from these measurements, we have seen that uh, the oxygen was increased substantially, as well as the CO2 was increased substantially. And we carry out this measurement with gadolinium X, but also the control sample was performed with water. And as you could see here, this colored spot stays only in the case when gadolinium zeolite X was applied. Also, we wanted to use these zeolite nanoparticles as an intracellular localization uh, vector. And therefore, we've been encapsulating ruthenium complexes. And here are some of our recent studies. So in summary, today I try to convince you that the properties of nanozeolites could be controlled via rational synthesis design. 
And currently there are many creative synthesis approaches that are used and still under development. And we could prepare template-free nano zeolites with various framework structures. We could also prepare defect-free zeolites that have extreme stability and uh, they also are very resistant to coking. We could prepare single site catalysts, which is very interesting for catalysis purposes. What we would like to do in the future, we would like to is extend the number of the nano zeolite because as I stated in the beginning, Currently, from 250 available zeolite structures, we could synthesize only 25. So we hope in the future, with the help of all young researchers, to enlarge the number of these nanoparticles, to be able to scale up. Some of them are already scaled up uh, from uh, big companies in the area. Also to be able to process these nano zeolites to an ultimate products. Today, I just show you concepts, concepts developed in the lab, but it's very difficult to translate this to real production. And as I mentioned, we've been working very much uh, in catalysis field, uh, gas separation, but now we are very much interested in medical uses, food, cosmetics, and nanotechnology. So with this, uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, the people who contributed uh, to this work. And uh, I put uh, the pictures of the main player for each individual study. But also, I have to thank uh, all my colleagues uh, from the LCS team. I would like also to thank uh, the industrial uh, chair, uh, big project currently we have uh, with uh, Total, also uh, UOP Honeywell, and some of this work uh, was uh, carried out within the industrial associated laboratory, Elia Zeolite, which is between the Chinese Academy of Science and uh, our institute. And I would like to thank you very much for listening to me and uh, also to be so patient. Uh, I spoke uh, more than 45 minutes. Sorry for the delay. delay. Thank you. Thank you very much for this excellent talk. And it was really exciting, especially for this non-traditional application of zeolites and medical application. Uh, is there any question? Yes, I, I have a question. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you again. And I have two questions. One of them is extremely naive. You know, I'm completely illiterate when it comes to zeolites. So when you talk about this reversibility, how do you achieve the reversibility by changing the temperature, applying mechanical forces? And my second question is about this the tumor application. How exactly do you? You know, do you control the, uh, what exactly drives your the, the nanoparticles towards the tumor? What do you think? What what, how, what what can you say about this? So when we talk about reversibility, reversibility could be achieved first uh, via using different inorganic cations. This inorganic cation would move depending on the amount of water introduced in the zeolite or amount of other analyte, could be, for example, CO2, could be uh, in anything, any uh, organic compound, which will absorb and make this cation to go out from the eight member ring. And then when we desorb the compound, the cation goes back. So this cause the change in the shape and also the size of this eight member ring. As you mentioned, also this um, reversibility could be achieved via external force, pressure. For example, some people would use external pressure to cause also flexibility of the structure. 
There are several approaches, but here we would like to explore the possibility of using different mobile cations. And these cations on one side bring uh, this uh, flexibility or breeding, which before was not observed for zeolites. As you know, zeolites are very rigid. They are crystalline material. They have only T atoms, silicon or aluminum, while in moths was expected. In moths, we have the organic ligand and inorganic uh, part. So their breeding was expected, but for zeolite uh, was not uh, self-explanatory. So we were uh, very glad uh, to, to uh, report on this. And the second question, uh, what drives nano zeolites going in the brain, in the tumor? Actually, it is the deficiency of oxygen. So mm. in the tumor, we do not have oxygen. Then the blood barrier is destroyed and therefore the nanoparticles would go there and would deliver the um, oxygen. So th there is a diffusion gradient maybe, or sorry, oxygen gradient maybe. Yes, right. yes, because of the oxygen gradient, exactly. So before, uh, maybe 10 years ago, uh, colleagues from here, uh, it's, a, it's called Ciceron Laboratory, where uh, people have been working on brain tumor for a very long time. They found out that patients with tumor, if they inhale oxygen, they have improvement. Yeah. People with stroke, if immediately after the stroke, they inhale oxygen, also there is improvement. But it takes very long time, the oxygen to go from breathing to the brain, while with this targeted injection, it takes two minutes. So that's why uh, they suggest uh, this study and uh, they were the driving force. We selected the materials, but they have done uh, all the work, uh, the, the bio-oriented uh, work. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Mm. Maybe I can ask a question. Uh, uh, your group leads this template free uh, synthesis of uh, uh, nano, nano zeolites, and, uh, and you obtained really high crystalline yield. Uh, what would be the further advancement in this green synthesis of zeolites and also uh, for hierarchical zeolites? And uh, nowadays, uh, green synthesis is, uh, as you said, as you mentioned, it's the the um, most important, uh, it's really important to, uh, to obtain this mass production in the industry. So what could be the further advancements in this field? So for the green synthesis, uh, the next stage for us uh, is uh, to uh, increase the silicon to aluminum ratio, because using inorganic cations, we could reach the highest silicon to aluminum ratio 2.6 we could not go further. However, via post-synthesis treatment, this could be modified. So this is one way to continue our research. Second, these nanoparticles could have very different framework type structure. And as I mentioned, now one of the main interests is to capture CO2. So to capture CO2, it's not only from uh, flue gas or from natural gas, but also there is a great need for capturing CO2 from the air, just like this with very low concentration. And these materials are extremely interesting, but they should be selective. They should not take water and CO2. They should take CO2 predominantly and they should not be sensitive to water. So now we are also working in this field, trying to make nanoparticles with very, very small pore sizes and to have a barrier which would allow only CO2 to enter, but 
not the rest of the compounds in the uh, air. And also we would like to be able not only to work with the internal pore volume, but also to work with the external surface. So a lot of work is going on on the surface modification of these nanoparticles. Then going to catalysis. Catalysis, now there are new processes. There is a great need for hydrogen. We should find material that works outside of the comfort zone of any porous existing material. As you know, zeolites are stable in comparison with MOVs, in comparison with mesoporous silica, but still now the new processes, we should go to 1000. So 1000 degree, this material should survive. And therefore now we are also uh, going in this direction to uh, make crystals really perfect without any defects crystals that would preserve the structure and would not be cold with time, would not be uh, affected by uh, the presence of corrosive compounds such as sulfur containing compound. For the bio application, we are uh, very much interested in any topics related to it, uh, bio application where injectable nano zeolite is required. And the three projects uh, I show you today are currently running, but also uh, now we have the so-called maturation program. Uh, maturation program is for a startup. So from next year, uh, we would have a startup uh, company on this topic. So this is something that we really would like to transfer to a different scale. And I mentioned that we scale up uh, several of the zeolites and this uh, has been done with the help of Total and UOP Honeywell. So we've been working with them for a while and they support our research and then uh, we provide the technology to them. So there are many possibilities uh, and uh, you know it very well. Uh, <laughs> so it's a sorcery, it's catalysis, it's yeah. cosmetic. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we were approached from uh, Chanel uh, also uh, for a very interesting topic where again, uh, zeolite nanoparticles could be applied. Yeah, there are many, many possibilities, but uh, I think that with people like you and uh, many other young colleagues, uh, we would be successful. <laughs> so <laughs> we are not a very big group. So uh, yeah, the whole institute, uh, we are 65 people. But we are, are doing great small. work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You are very kind, but we are, we are small. Uh, any question? Okay, and um, once again, thank you very much for this great talk. I wish we could do it in person, but uh, in the future we can do it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, and I would like to thank you for this invitation, and it was a pleasure to see you, and uh, I hope I was not that long. Actually, I was. No, Sorry. it was really <laughs> clear and exciting for me, at least. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes. Thank Have you. a very nice uh, weekend, uh, and uh, I, uh, I wish you all the best. Uh. Me too. Bye-bye. <laughs>